All right, so this is an episode of Dave's Garage. We're on location today. We're at GMD CompuTrack up in is it Fairmont? Fairmont, Fairmont, Georgia. So we've got Kent at GMD CompuTrack, who is a uh, well. You would be one of the preeminent. I mean, what other places would you go in the southeast? I mean, there's. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so down here, I mean, you guys, you do a lot of uh, pro race teams and, I mean, all kinds of stuff. So they've got all kinds of stuff. Like, when who was the guy at Barber, the AMA, the pro Amendo America racer that went down in the rain at like 140 or something last year? I'm drawing a blank. I don't remember who it was. But you had his you had his brace bike in here and straight in the frame and, and doing all that kind of stuff. So he's got a... You can West Beat, right? Like oh, yeah, I can edit this out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I always leave bloopers in just because people find it entertaining. I always go, oh, yeah, I'll edit that out later, and I never do. <laughs> All right, well, we'll look it up. But, yeah, there was uh, – I remember seeing I was like, ooh, this is not your normal Weira – track bike i was like this is the, this is legit this is the real deal and you were like doing all the laser frame measurements and all that kind of stuff so we've got the shop here and um kent did my speed twin um actually you've set up you and between you and tony you guys have done the suspension setup and or modifications on the last five or six bikes of mine so yeah <laughs> they joke and say i get my mail here but yeah um so we come here because this is where you go to get your stuff done right so um this comes up a lot on my channel when we're talking about suspension. People are asking, like, oh, just go th throw progressives in there. And, and, other, and I'm I'll, learning from people like you and Huey and stuff. Um, it's like, no, if you know your weight, you should go linear. So in your words, in your experience, which is decades, yep. if not generations, <laughs> been a while, um, where are – where are progressive springs applicable and where do you want to go from progressive and, and actually go into uh well we generally take progressive springs out and select a straight rate spring for a given rider's weight and that's linear straight right yes okay. straight straight rate spring um the uh progressive springs are applicable in the old days Okay. where they didn't have a good selection of spring rate choices and a progressive spring was kind of there was nothing else available so and there's a brand named that it's uh, right you know, pretty prolific uh, they've been around a long time but we find that straight rate springs with a very light amount of preload on them makes the bike supple at the top of the stroke and firm as you get into it this is an OEM spring, and people might call this a progressively wound spring, right. but it truly is a dual rate spring. It's got th this end of the spring is the soft end of the spring, and once this coil binds, then the stiffer end of the spring mm -hmm. takes over. Uh, what we find is a lot of times this is so soft, people will over preload it, right. try and make it firm enough, but a, you can't make up for a soft spring with more preload. It doesn't work. Okay. Okay. Um, so when you put enough preload on this that this is essentially coil bound, then all you've got is a straight rate spring left. So we choose a, the proper rate spring for the application and it's very lightly preloaded. So it's nice and supple at the top of the stroke. Yet as you get into the rate, the rate should go up in a linear fashion on a graph. Right. And uh, every millimeter of travel, the, the rate doesn't change, but the spring force goes up with every millimeter of travel. So that's, uh, there are some applications that we do use progressive springs, such as the KTM PDS rear shock, where the, they don't have a linkage on the swing arm. The shock mounts directly to the swing arm okay. and the frame, and that um, is a good place for a progressively wound spring so that you get a progressive rise in rate. Okay. Um, so something like a Ducati Diavel would be the same way. I think that mounts to the frame and right to the swing arm. So the swing and there's arm. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you have a linkage system, they build a rising rate into the link. Right. And that lets a dealer sell the same motorcycle to a 140-pound rider or a 340-pound rider. They can each ride away on the motorcycle, and it's okay. They, they can ride it. But okay. when we try to tune that bike for the 140-pound rider... It needs a different spring. Yeah. Right. We try to tune it for a 340 pound rider. Obviously, it needs a different spring, or anywhere uh -huh. in between. It, 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 it goes on a scale. And and that's why I've tried to explain to people where it's like they're like, well, that's what the dealers, you know, that's what the manufacturers use. And it's like, well, they don't know who's buying the bike. Like your right. point, it could be a little little tiny Asian woman, or it could be a, a dude my size, and it has to be. 
acceptable, at least. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be dangerous. It'll be safe. But as soon as you want to get the bike dialed in, you know, to me, it never made sense to upgrade two progressive springs because you know your weight. You know your riding conditions. You know your riding style. And so, um, you know, picking something that isn't really ideal because what it had been explained to me, either by you or Huey, or maybe it was Tony, um, was the how do you match your damping? to a spring rate that's changing as you go through the uh through the stroke you know um, if you set it for the soft part then it's going to be under damped and springy when you get to the stiff part you know especially rebound yes. and then if you set it for the stiffer part then it might be over damped and harsh up top absolutely um on the forks where you have linear travel the damping is not position sensitive it's the, the mid-stroke early in the stroke, late in the stroke, the damping is pretty much the same for right. the whole stroke. It's speed sensitive. So, uh, yeah, and it has to, the damping needs to be commensurate with the spring rate for the thing to function right. I mean, obviously, right. uh, a lot of people ride things that just aren't right, and they don't know what they're missing. Yeah, I think that's what it, that's the biggest t part of it, trying to explain to people, is that if you're not a fast rider, if you don't know what this stuff is, you may take your, your, your street twin, your entry level Bonneville, which comes with a progressive from the factory, and you buy another progressive spring, but it's heavier. So it does feel better. It's not bottoming out as much. And to them, oh, this is great. This is a vast improvement. And I'm thinking, well, but if you're going to the trouble and expense of pulling the forks off and changing out the, you know, flushing the fluid, putting in a new spring anyway, go linear, like every time, go Should linear. A linear straight rate spring. When we take this out of a stock fork, it will have 30, 40, 50 millimeters of preload on it, which is going to all but collapse this in some cases, when, especially when a home tuner has gone in and put more preload in it because it's not firm enough. Right. They collapse this, and they're left with a straight rate spring in the fork. It, it's collapsed in the preload process. Yeah. Um, when we go back with the right spring for a rider's weight, we may only have eight millimeters or 12 millimeters of preload on it at where it had 30 or 40 millimeters on its stock. Huh. Um, the heavier the bike, the more preload you need. Right. Um, but when we have the right, the, the right spring rate, very lightly preloaded, it's plush and compliant and supple. Awesome. And that's what you're always shooting for. Everyone thinks, oh, it's got to be stiff. And it's like, no. No, I mean, you want it to be supportive of the weights. So you're not bottoming out. And you, when you, you know, when you hit the brakes, it doesn't dive too much. But at the same time, People also tend to think suspension is for absorbing hits, and it's like, no, it's supposed to go in both directions. You don't want it to top out either, right? So you, you want everything. Um, I think the way Tony explained it one time was he's like, you know, watch any racer or watch anybody going down the road, and you'll see them going over the rumble strips, and you'll see the front tire fluttering, but the bike is gliding. Yep. He's like, and so that, that's where you want the suspension to take the hits and be able to extend when it goes into like into a pothole or something like that, or when the road moves away. Um, but have that not transfer to the rider. You want the bike to kind of go like this while the tire's fluttering around. Terminology is important here. We do, and I'm using the wrong terms. No, no, oh. not necessarily, but just for, just for clarity. Um, we go for a firm, compliant ride. Okay. Firm enough to do the job, yeah, compliant so it's plush. Um, stiff is a problem. Okay. Stiff is different than firm. And when you take too light a spring and put too much preload on it, the spring rate is still too soft. Okay. But it, now it's stiff. You know, it's a bit of a oxymoron, if you will, but it, it's it's true. You, when you put the right rate spring there, very lightly preloaded, you have a plush and supple ride that's compliant and takes bumps well, holds it up, has good bottoming resistance, yet floats floats over bumps, so the suspension, the wheel stays and follows the undulations in the road. Yet the platform is stable. Right. And that, that comes through a balance of good damping and the right spring rate and the right amount of preload, which gives you the right amount of sag, which is the way that we monitor. We, when we measure sags, mm -hmm. like we've done for you many mm -hmm. times, the, the sag numbers, you have the, the bike sag and then the rider sag. When you add those together, you get your total amount of sag. And if you don't have all three of those numbers, it's really hard to make decisions. You can't make a good decision yeah. on what to, to do with it. So. That's our goal is the firm but compliant ride. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you much for your time and for your service as always. Appreciate it. You're I'm welcome. sure my viewers will get something out of this. So I've tried explaining it, but hearing it from someone who, like I said, does this for a living, 
um, will probably make a little bit more sense. Well, one more one more note. This is our this is our spring rate tester, which okay. allows us to once we have the SAG numbers, we can uh, if there's a need to make changes. Most OEM springs don't have ratings marked on them, and rarely are there specs in manuals. Sometimes there are, mm -hmm. but a lot of times they're, they're, you don't know. So you put a spring in this machine and compress it and measure the rate of the spring, then we can correlate the sag numbers to the uh, the spring rate that's on the motorcycle. Then that lets us make a wise choice on where yeah. to go with our spring rate choices. Get all the cool toys here, Kent. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Bye. Thanks again. Appreciate it. You're welcome.